discipleship, we're going to be talking about demon possession. Now, contrary to the majority of Christians, they think that saved Christians cannot be demon possessed. True. Saved Christians, it is very possible they face demon possession. It doesn't mean that they're lost or they lost salvation or that their soul is in danger of the devil, but it is very possible that their bodies can face demon possession. I'll explain why. But first, let's go one by one through our subject on demon possession. The first subject, uh, the first section is how to be demon possessed. So how to be demon possessed. In order to understand this more fully, why Christians can be demon and what is demon possession, what's the limitation of demon possession, you got to first understand how it begins, how it starts. So we're going to start off with Mark chapter 5, and then we'll look at verses 8. So these are all the signs of a demon-possessed person. And by understanding the signs of a demon-possessed person, then we can figure out how demon possession works, how it starts, and how it operates. Verse 8, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So notice that it's when it refers to the unclean or an evil spirit inside a man. That's one. Now notice that in verse 9, He's controlled by many of them, legion. Notice in verse 10, that he would not send them away. Verse 11, great herd of swine. Verse 12, send us into the swine that we may notice, enter into them. So it refers to entering inside people. You'll notice that in verse 13, once the devil comes out of the body of the, verse, uh, of the person, verse 14, they control the being. So once the devil goes inside some sort of being, person, or animal, the person or animal is being uncontrolled. Now, in verse 15, possessed with the devil, and he's not in mind when he used to be demon-possessed. So we see right here, it refers to devils being inside, and another thing is you're not able to control it or being controlled by devils, when the devils are able to control you. Those are the important points to understand on how to be demon Now, we're going to look also that in verse 1 Kings chapter 22, turn over there, please, 1 Kings chapter 22, then we'll read verse 6, and then verses 19 through 23. 1 Kings chapter 22, and then we'll read. Through 20. Right here, it, demon possession, it began. Or starts with a person's sin. That's how devil possession begins. It doesn't have to be like taking Ouija boards or asking the devil to come inside you. Look at verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go unto Rabeth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And then verse 7, Jehoshaphat's inquiring for a different pr prophet. Now in verse 6, notice that the false prophets told Ahab, Go, you're going to prosper. Now notice that the prophets are not the ones actually saying it, even though it is of their own will. They're being controlled by something else. In verse 8, the king has Micaiah the prophet prophesy in the right manner. Verse 9 as well. Now look at verse 19. 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, now look at this, exactly what the false prophet said. Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. 
And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also go forth and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. So notice the word devil possessed them. Not only that, but you notice in these four uh, passages, which we won't turn to, but you're going to notice how unclean spirits enter inside people through various kinds of sins. There is no doubt about that. That's how devil possession begins. We see this in Judges 9. We also see this in Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 14, as well as Romans chapter 11 and verse 8. If you look at all those three passages, you'll notice that there are different spirits of sin. Different spirits of sin. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4. This one is very much a Upon. Look at First Timothy 4, through 1 through 2. How we can really tell that you are possessed is if your conscience is seared. First Timothy chapter 4. That's when we know for a fact that the devils really got you. Because now the conscience doesn't bother you. See that? The conscience doesn't bother you as much. That's your only freedom. That's the only thing where you can live accordingly. And if the conscience can control you and it's seared, what else will control you? It's the devil. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. See that? Listen to devils. Seduce. Remember 1 Kings 22? Uh, that seduce the prophets to speak a lie. It begins like that. Now look at verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Well, that matches definitely with 1 Kings 22, lying spirit. Having their what? Conscience seared with a hot iron. So that's something very sobering. When the conscience is seared, then you know that something else has gotten you. And if it's not your conscience that gotten you, who else got you? Something sobering to think about. possession this is how demon possession operates if you understand that then you don't you know it is very capable for a christian to be demon possessed then you can see that but let's keep going through our verses now another section we're going to cover is fighting against devils fighting against devils let me know if i go too low but we're going to look at several passages right here Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Think about it. What else fight devils in your daily in your body? Why else would he do if the devils can't take a hold of you? That's why it's very important that you understand spiritual warfare. It is very important that you understand Christians can be capable of demon possession. Now, we're not going to look at all of these, but we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and 2 Corinthians 10. So we're going to look at those two passages. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 10. The other two verses, which we won't turn to, is James 4, 7, Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, 27. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 12. And then later on, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, what's important to understand is that, remember, conscience seared, right? If conscience is seared, it can't rescue you from devils attacking your mind. How do you listen? Where, when do you listen and heed to devils? It starts with a thought. See? It starts with a thought where they attack your mind and insert and words into you where you can listen to them. It starts with the mind. But let's look at Ephesians 6, verse 12. Look at this. Why else would God say in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, devils, right? We know that. In where? High places. Okay, remember that. Devils are in high places. 
Follow that context of 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Does that passage sound like deja vu? It's, it's repeating Ephesians 6, 12. So it's going to talk about devils. But look at this. Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down, what does it say? Imaginations and every what? High thing. Remember, the context is spiritual warfare, devils. And that high thing matches with Ephesians 6, 12, with high places where devils are at. There is no doubt this is referring to devils tempting you in your mind. That's why God's telling you to cast it down. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's why James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, so that what? He can flee. And then if you look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, this is a sobering thought. It says, neither give place to the devil. Now, why would it say that if Christians cannot be devil-possessed? So that's why it's very important to understand that. A lot of churches don't teach and believe that. And if you don't teach and believe that, then it is a very dangerous thing for Christians, which is perhaps why we see a lot of Christians falling into apostasy. A lot of devils, demonic activity in saved Christian churches. How did that happen? Because they're not aware of spiritual warfare. Now I'm going to teach you about casting demons. So this is how you cast out demons. What's important to understand is that in order to cast out demons, it's not the same way as the signs and wonders back at Mark chapter 16. The apostles could just call the devil out and the devil leaves. But those are sign gifts, according to Mark 16. And signs operated to the children of Israel. We saw that First 1 Corinthians 1. So then, save Christians, how do we cast out demons? We can't just say, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. No wonder some charismatic pastors, can't, you sense a lot of demonic activity in them. See, they're just tempting. They're just uh, playing with the devil. You don't do that. How you cast out demons is very different. Look at Revelation. Chapter and then verse 9 and verse 11. 12 verse 9, verse 11. We're not going to turn to this one, but the next one is first. We won't turn to it. You got to do? You got you to gotta plead the blood of Jesus Christ because you're definitely has no power against that wicked one. Don't you dare say, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 12, 9. And the great dragon cast that old serpent called the devil. Now look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God. Day so notice right here, Satan is accusing the brethren context of today's today's day and age, where Satan is tempting uh, saved Christians today. But how do you get the victory? Now look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the what? Blood of the Lamb. So brethren can only conquer him by the blood of the Lamb. Now look at another one. Look at, uh, well, we won't turn there, but 1 John 1, 7, what does it say? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all what? Sins. How do devils start possessing you? Through sins, right? Remember that? That's why it's important to plead the blood to cleanse the sin. And verse 9 says how you plead the blood is by confessing your sin. That's how you plead the blood against the wicked one. You confess the sin to God and you plead that blood of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, here is my sin. This is what Satan's telling me in my head. This is what he's trying to oppress me with, possess me with, tempt me with. I plead the blood of Jesus to wash it away and forgive me. Now look at Luke chapter 10. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. No, you need to plead the full name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need the full name. I don't want the humanity, just the humanity of Christ for the power. Jesus of Nazareth, that's his human nature. I want God head involved. Now look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we will read verse 17. Do it under the full name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please 
So call out that name. You need to call out that name when that wicked one tempts you. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy word. See that? So only the wind can when you have the name, name not all my for those of you who are curious what the full name is, his full the full name of the Godhead is pretty apparent throughout the Bible. Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you have the Father, Jesus the Son, and Christ the Holy Spirit, meaning the anointed. Now look at Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Mark chapter 9, verse 29. You know what you also need to do? The third thing, when you're really desperate, you need to fast and pray. You need to fast and pray. So if it's gotten to a point where it's really bad, you need to get on your knees and pray. You know why? Because that flesh is being crucified. That sinful nature of the flesh is being crucified, debased more and more, while you're focusing more and more into the spiritual realm when you're praying. Isn't that right? When you pray, you think you're being more fleshy or more spiritual. You're being more focused on being spiritual. Look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 29. You need to fast and pray. Why is fasting so important? Because it crucifies that flesh. The only verse that tells you how to cast out devils, demon possession, how to get rid of demon possession, is subtracted by Bibles. Fast and pray. Didn't you know that? No wonder. There's a lot of demonic activity, demon possession, with modern Bibles? No, not my NIV. No, not my NASV. No, not my uh, modern version. Yes, sir. Look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 29. Now, I don't know which modern version, a few of any of them did subtract it, but I do know this modern version. Let's look at Mark 9, 29. And he said unto them, this kind, can come forth by nothing, but by what? Prayer, fasting. That's very important. Let's talk about of demon possession. Uh, the person that you see on the street, we see a lot of demon possession on the streets when we street preach. We see a lot of demon possession in college. We see a lot of demon possession in San Francisco Bay Area. We see a lot of demon possession in Hollywood. But how do we know? Here are the marks of demon possession. It is first, I'm saying, first Timothy 4 1. It's heeding to false doctrine. Why we stand for right doctrine? Why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important for right doctrine. You can be demon possessed. That's why you see these certain pastors who are KJV only, and they just look like the devil when they attack the nation of Israel and go anti-Semitic, and they say free Palestine, and they support Muslims, and these are KJV only Baptists? What kind of demonic, how can you, how can you, so how, what functions can do that unless it's something so demonic that possesses you? That's a mark of demon possession. Another thing is magic. Acts 16, 16. Another mark of demon possession is getting into magic. Oh, Harry Potter, it's for children. What's wrong with that? It's demon possession, man. It's demon possession. That's why we stress so much. We don't care if it looks childish. Now, here's something important. Another one is superpower. Superpower. Mark chapter 5, verse 2 through 4. You'll notice that the demoniac of Gadara, he was able to break chains. Now, it's one thing when it's mental as well as uh, full power where you work out and then you can do, uh, when you can do weightlifting and do crazy stuff like breaking boards or whatnot, or even martial arts. But you got to realize this. It gets now to an abnormal point where Definitely not biological, but this is something else where it's more of the soulish nature where it reaches the mind, which is not biological. It's more of the soulish nature where it's the spiritual realm. That's why martial arts, it is a natural means, but there is no doubt there is some of it that is demon possession as well. That's why you got to be careful of some martial arts activity. Why do you think they stress on meditation? 
and stuff like that. See, to connect with devils, to have some sort of superpower. Another thing, a mark of devil possession is public nudity. Can I repeat that? Nudity, public nudity is devil possession. That's why. Why is it that you see these college students, students, these young people, acting like their conscience does not even bother them when somebody preaches the gospel at the Mardi Gras party, pass it out, passes out tracts to them, and these students, they just mock them and poke fun at them, throw stuff at them, and say, hail Satan, stuff like that. Only a mark of a devil-possessed person would do that because what? They glamorize sexual things. Sexual things. That's why it's also important to understand that the mark of devil possession is public nudity. And when Christians start to lean more and more into dressing in this manner, and you got to ask yourself this, are you devil possessed? That's why the preaching doesn't hit you. That's why the witnessing of the brethren doesn't hit you. That's why your conscience doesn't bother you, and you get even more stubborn where your conscience doesn't bother you. Why is that? Devil possession is very possible. Christians can be demon possessed. It's very possible. That's why you see new evangelical churches, Christians always whining about their dressing. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Say Christians in these non-denominational churches wearing short shorts and stuff like that. And they worship Jesus out of a clean conscience doing that. Isn't that strange? Devil possession. Doesn't this make more sense now that you believe in de demon possession? It makes more sense now. Another thing is self-infliction. That is devil possession. You'll notice that the maniac of Gadara, he cut. I, who in their right mind? What kind of demonic religion will tell people to flagellate, to beat themselves in a holy for the Lord? What kind of religion will promote that as something holy? Unless it's so demonic. That's why Roman Catholicism is a demonic religion, devil-possessed religion. Another thing is speaking in tongues. Oh, I'm going to offend a lot of Christians here. I'm already offending enough Christians already so far. You, think? you know, this is, should be the sin of all people. Why is so many saved Christians, you see them doing that, without their Unless you believe saved Christians can be demon-possessed. This makes sense, doesn't it? Now, we're going to turn to these two verses. Well, actually, uh, yes, we will. Okay, go over there. You know, so driven by emotion that the word of God does not create their What it would drive them to do that, no matter how show them what's wrong with speaking in tongues, unless it's some kind of devil that possess these people. So that's why I'm going to, we have to look at these verses. That way you can understand it is clearly being in possession. Now look at those two passages, Luke 9 and 1 Corinthians 14. Luke 9 and 1 Corinthians 14. Now notice what the Bible says about devil possession. We're going to start off at verse 39. The Bible says right here, and lo, a spirit taketh them. Now, let's, this is different from charismatic churches. And he Suddenly crieth out, and it careth him that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. What makes loud abnormal noises all of a sudden, sporadically, and rolling around the ground. Now let's look at, uh, uh, oh, you know, I never said it was devil possession. I never said that. You automatically assumed it was devil possession because you know it is in that verse. Anyways, look at 1 Corinthians 14. Speaking of tongues is undoubtedly devil possession. Why is that? Not the biblical speaking of tongues. Because the biblical speaking of tongues in verse 23, notice that it's a group of people speaking in tongues together at verse 23. God disapproves of that. He says that's madness. Look at verse 27. This tongue is interpreted. It's a language. It's a normal language that has an interpreter, not blah, blah, blah. God is not of that. Now look at the next verse. Look at verse uh, 33. For God is not the author of what? 
confusion. Okay, so he called this confusion, and God's not the author of that. If God is not the author of that, who is the author? Okay, I never said it was the devil. Don't, don't, charismatics, don't get all touchy on me now and start drooling all over the floor, foaming at the mouth, rolling around the ground now, like you do in your church services. Don't do that. Don't get all emotional on me. That's probably the devil in you. I was coming out. All right, now I know I'm being sarcastic right here, but you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to pound it into you because you, some of you have got some devils in you that you're so stubborn that no matter how long Pastor Kim has been patient and been loving and showing the scriptures, that kind of spirit within you, if that's not of God, that keeps rejecting it, that's something else, and I'm going to have to rebuke that spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you just felt uncomfortable when his name just now, didn't I, when I rebuked it? Is that the devil in you? Satan doesn't like this teaching tonight. Look at Luke chapter 8. Mental anguish. Mental anguish. Now, remember, it's very important to understand there are some people who are born mentally ill. There are some people who genuinely went through uh, physical diseases where it mentally damaged them. So not all mentally ill people are demon-possessed. But you got to understand this too. Not all of it is normal either. So those kind of processes can be very demonic, demon possession, in Luke chapter 8, verse 35. All right, now we're going to prove right here that Christians can be demon-possessed. But before we go there, we're going to look at Luke chapter 8. And verse 35, please. Luke chapter 8, and we will read verse 35. So we have uh, plenty of time to spare. So let's go through some of these verses here. We're going to look at Luke 8, 35, mental anguish. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his what? Right mind. So you got to realize this. A lot of uh, mental illnesses, you got to understand, can be... Demon possession. And I've seen that in churches before. I've seen some people who are genuinely mentally ill, but all of a sudden something happened in their life. And some mysterious, uh, unprecedented, unexplainable incident happened in their lives, and a normal same person all of a sudden just acted abnormal. Started to think, say things that were just pure fantasy. And not only that, roll, roll their eyes over and drool and make noises. Very strange. So the explanation, which makes a lot of sense, demon possession. Demon possession. Marks of demon possession. I think I should preach a whole sermon on this. Do you think I'm going to get a lot of people offended after that? Do you think I'm going to get a lot of saved Christians who are demon possessed walking out mad in the church services? A lot of saved Christians who are demon possessed sending angry emails and angry phone calls that that's of God. I cannot believe that you're saying that that's of the devil. Do you think I'm going to see a lot of attacks and criticisms from saved Christians saying, oh, you didn't have to show this, say this kind of stuff. You didn't have to put out that sarcastic tone and that kind of sharp point. You see, what is this then? What is this spirit? What is this spirit? And I'm doing this, I'm saying this, out of prayerfulness, out of love, and out of, why am I being so sharp here? Because when it comes to demonic activity, this is not a time where you play tiddly wings. This is where you take out the double-edged short, and you got to cut. you got to cut. You've got to cut. Also going to uh, turn to uh, demon-possessed Christians right here. Look at Mark chapter 5. Now, this is going to be utmost proof of demon possession, demon possession. Demon possessed Christians. There is absolutely no doubt saved Christians can be demon possessed. Now, a lot of saved Christians will say, no, that's not true and stuff like that. Now, a lot of them are genuine people, sincere, love the Lord, and some of them even live better lives than me. And I'll say amen to that. Some of them are better Christians than I am. But I want to say this, and I don't want Christians to misunderstand me for saying this, especially Bible believers. Now, there are some Bible believers who says Christians cannot be demon-possessed. And I want to say this carefully 
And I don't want them to misunderstand me or criticize me heavily on this. But I'm going to give a warning right here, which is very urgent. I'm saying this out of the honesty of pure spirit. If God did not, if that's not God, if that's not a right doctrine, if that's not the Holy Spirit in you that said that, that I don't believe saved Christians can be demon-possessed, then what other thing led you to say that? Because they don't want you to be aware of spiritual warfare. They want to take control of saved Christians. They want to ruin churches. That's a very sobering thought. I'm not saying that they're demon-possessed, okay? I'm not saying that. But it is something you should seriously question yourself. And, and you, this is something that you do have to believe. Saved Christians can be demon-possessed. That is very important to understand. Now, a lot of people have a hard time understanding that, which is totally understandable to me. So we're going to go one by one, and I'm going to explain. Okay? But first of all, let's go to Mark chapter 5, verses 8 through 15. Mark 5, verses 8 through 15. Mark 5, is 8 through 15. The start of everything concerning demon possession, correct? All right, look at Mark chapter 5, verses 8 through 15. For he said unto him, Come what? Out of the man, thou unclean spirit. It is important to understand that uh, demon possession, how it all begins, is when the devil is inside you. And then uh, look at verse 9. Thousands of them are inside. That's very possible. Look at verse 10. Send A out of the country. So it's got to go out of the body. Look at verse 11. They're seeing a great herd of swine. Look at verse 12. Send us into the swine. See that? It all has to do with devils being inside you. That's important to understand. Right? And we also looked at it before. Control by devils. That's where we see demon possession. We see that very plainly. That's where we see demon possession. Correct? Can we all agree with that at Mark 5? It's when they're inside you and when they control you. So when something else controls you and something else is inside of you that's unexplainable, you got to really be open-minded to the fact that I could have devils in me. That's why it's very important to understand that. Now, I know we read this passage at the beginning of the Bible study, but it's important to understand that. Verse 13, they're not of their own. They're not being controlled, and they're reacting very weird, not normal. Verse 14, devils are controlling them and make them do something weird as well. Uh, look at verse 15, possessed with the devil, and he's not in his right mind when he used to be demon-possessed. So that's important to understand. It's not in the right mind. It's being controlled by something else, and they're inside. That is extremely important to understand. That is extremely important to understand. Now we're going to look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4. Now, notice what the Word of God says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Some Christians might say, man, pastor, saying this kind of stuff, you're going to have somebody uh, bite you one day, and they're going to walk away from your church one day. They're going to unsubscribe from you. They're going to leave you. It's going to bite you one day. Hey, I'm all ready for that. That don't bother me one bit. I don't care if a person's been in my church for three years, four years, five years, six years, ten years, twenty years. Or ever since the beginning of my church, I don't care. All right, this kind of sharpness, a person can walk out. That don't bother me. So before people act all judgmental and con and condemning me and stuff like that, I'm all ready for that. I'm non-compromising. I don't care about that. I know when that I have to be patient and loving with people because a pastor cannot change a person's life. Only the Holy Spirit can. I can only take action if it damages the church as a whole, if they do something that really hurts the church. But I can't correct everybody's sins in their lives, obviously. But the thing is this. I also don't back out when I, uh, when I rebuke sin, when I step on toes in teaching and preaching. I don't care about that. Now, we're going to look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Acts 4. Look at this. This is a saved. Okay. 
a saved person. Acts 4.32 and chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Saved person, who saved Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Well, verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed, right, that believed, yes, saved people, were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Correct? So they were giving away their possessions. They were all getting involved with these saved believers. Now look at Acts 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. See, they were part of that group of people giving out possessions. Okay. Uh, Sure, I'll try to. Maybe it's because I'm being too close to. That's very possible. The devil don't like it, see? The devil don't like this teaching. He wants saved Christians to be demon-possessed like some of you probably were all this time, maybe. He doesn't want you to be free. He does not want you to be free. How do I sound? Uh, it's kind of being choppy. Hold on. Satan don't like the word of God. Satan don't want people to be free. Amen. Okay. How do I sound now? Just let me know if it's being choppy again. We're going to look at Acts chapter 5, verse 1. All right. See, he was part of these saved believers giving out possessions, right? But look at verse 2. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath, Satan, why hath who? Satan filled thine heart. See, that inside. That saved Christian. He filled within him, inside him. What's that? I mean, if, if you want the Holy Spirit to possess you, fill your heart. What's the opposite of that? Satan filling up your heart. Satan possessing you. Now look at Ephesians 4, 27. Now this is definite proof you're demon possessed. Look at Ephesians 4, 27. This is definite proof. People don't believe in demon possession. Well, look at this verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Okay. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. What does the Bible say? Neither have what? Place... Who is he speaking to? You can't say, oh, dispensational to Jews. You know, don't be a hyper now. Oh, this is this is only for lost people. No, he's speaking to saved Christians here. Give place to the devil. What's a place? A place is some you inhabit where you live. And if you don't believe me, look up every verse in the Bible that says place. All right. That should be convincing. But if that's not convincing. We're not going to look at these passages, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 20. What did Jesus say to Peter, who's a saved person, a saved saint? What did Jesus say to Peter? Get thee behind me who? That's not Peter that Jesus was talking to. That was Satan. You're not convinced? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. His spirit is saved, this person. This person's spirit is saved, so he's a saved Christian. But his flesh turned over to the devil. It's a saved Christian whose flesh is turned over to the devil. That's the explanation of being So a lot of people, this is important to understand, people cannot understand saved Christians being demon-possessed because they have the Holy Spirit living inside them. So because the Holy Spirit's living inside them, the Holy Spirit cannot live together with devils. That's why they say it's impossible for a Christian to be demon-possessed. But here's the thing. The Spirit is saved. That's what the verse says. The Holy Spirit, he is in your spiritual nature. See? The Holy Spirit is not a part of your fleshy nature. Is the fleshy nature holy? Is the fleshy nature sinless? Is the fleshy nature incorruptible? No. It's sinful. It's not sinless. So, how, so obviously the Holy Spirit can't be within a part 
He's not a part of the fleshy nature. He divided spiritual circumcision. He did, made a borderline inside you where he is not a part of the fleshy nature and the Holy Spirit becomes a part of the spiritual nature. That's why the Holy Spirit lives inside your body because he put a boundary line where devils cannot cross that line, cross the line to get your soul. Your soul is eternally secured and saved, but not your body, man. Your body can be sinful. Satan can take control. That's why saved Christians can be demon-possessed. And we'll close it right here. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 19 through 20. Verses 19 through 20. These were people, Christians, who cast off the faith. See that? Saved Christians who cast off the faith. But then the verse says they were turned over to Satan. How about that? Saved Christians who cast off the faith turned over to Satan. That's why Paul Washer, John MacArthur, Ray Comfort, and those guys, these guys think that if these there are saved Christians who became atheists, they were never once saved to begin with. That's not true. You can be a saved Christian who cast off the faith and be demon. Here, that's why it's very important to understand that a saved Christian can be demon-possessed. And because a saved Christian can be demon-possessed, that's why it is very important that people are to be aware of this, of the spiritual battle, and not let that wicked one take control. That's, Satan don't like this teaching. We've gotten so many uh, disruptions tonight. You notice that? Because Satan doesn't like this teaching, and he does not want you to, people to understand this. All right, so your homework assignment, I will be posting that uh, in the end of this video. It will be reading Alvin Douglas and Dr. Rutman's Theological Studies. God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me 
not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.